From the heart of downtown Manhattan and the center of New York's legal district. With your host, Bianca Bezbeck. Today's program is When Law Goes Pop. Hello and welcome to Media Reporter. I'm your host, Bianca Bezdek, and I'm pleased to welcome as our guest today, Richard Sherwin, who is presently a professor of law at New York Law School and has been here since 1988. He also has been the senior instructor and coordinator of the lawyering program at NYU School of Law and has authored several works, of which his most recent book is entitled When Law Goes Pop, The Vanishing Line Between Law and Popular Culture. And here we see it. Hello, welcome. Hello, Thanks. great to be here. Great to have you. Now, we have the book in front of us. Can you please tell us uh, how you arrived at the title? Sure. Uh, the title is really a play on the word pop. There are a few different ways of thinking about it. When law goes pop, refers on the one hand to popular culture, the way law interacts with culture as a whole. And that's a new way of thinking about law, particularly in uh, law schools these days. Uh, it's also a reference to pop art, Andy Warhol and that crowd. Uh, the notion that law itself might have uh, something to do with the commodities that Andy Warhol has portrayed, like soup cans floating around in the marketplace. We could talk more about that. And the third um, sense of pop, of course, is the um, sense of a balloon going pop. Maybe if law has uh, become more like a commodity or an entertainment device, uh, uh, it's legitimacy is threatened. And if that's the case, we might say it goes pop. Pretty. Uh, your book has been characterized by critics as detailing the, quote, two-way traffic between law and popular culture, and how concepts of law get transformed in the press and on television and films, and then, then consequently work their way back into the courtroom. Now, I've read this book, and I must say it's quite a thorough piece of work. <laughs> what was your impetus for writing it? The impetus? Well, you know, uh, we're living in change times. Uh, the written word may not be as powerful uh, a communication device as it was uh, only a few years, a few decades ago. We're, we're living in a visually literate society. And uh, it's not surprising, perhaps, that lawyers are becoming more and more adapted to visual forms of communication. And that's what the courtrooms are like these days. More and more lawyers are showing evidence uh, through visual demonstrations at the through simulations, charts, and other electronic uh, forms of communication. They're even arguing uh, through visuals, showing movies uh, to a jury uh, to persuade them uh, that their client's view is the right view. Uh, that is a significant shift. And my book is largely about what that shift means, what the shift to visual literacy means from the point of view of practicing law today. Now, when we take these two arenas, law and commercial mass media, when they do, in fact, converge on the same image or the same story in search of uh, self-legitimation, which do you believe prevails? Which prevails? You know, mm. there's, a, there's a case example I could think of that makes the point for me. Think about court TV. Court TV bills itself as justice without scripts. At least that's one of the promos they've used. And I think um, there's something deceptive about that. Um, Maybe it goes back to Steve Brill's original idea for the uh, network. His idea was an epiphany. He describes it as seeing the combination of C-SPAN and soap operas. Mm. And uh, I think he pulled that off. What it is is reality to a certain extent. But of course, it's reality that is filtered through what we might call the Packaged. It's packaged, and it's um, packaged I with one eye on the expectations of uh, the TV audience. In fact, the formula for court TV is not very different from most of commercial television. Mm. Uh, you don't see uh, the run-of-the-mill case on court TV. In fact, if you should really sort of list up all the cases they've had on court TV, most of them feature some form of sex or violence, or some combination, hopefully. Um, the only contract dispute that I can remember seeing on Court TV involved Pamela Anderson. Um, and uh, she had a dispute with her Baywatch producers. Of course, that was great for the network. They got to advertise the trial mm. uh, by showing scenes from Baywatch. Um, but that was the only contract case, I think, that made it through. So I can see how to, that appeals to viewers. Yeah. It gets attention. It gets attention. And, and I think that's the answer to your question. You know, what wins out? Well, um, unfortunately, as in 
journalism and politics, what wins out, tends to be um, the most amusing image we can find or the most titillating. Mm. Now let's take a step back for a second. Let's begin with the attorney. What are lawyers, really? Um, are they storytellers? Or do they have a responsibility not to feed public passions or prejudices in court with uh, the techniques that the media itself uses? Mm, well, you know, it's interesting the way you phrase the question. I hear it in terms of a choice. Are mm. they either storytellers or do they have uh, an obligation to... What are they and what should they be? Okay, well, that's, that's a good way of putting it. I think lawyers are storytellers and they've always been storytellers. Uh, there's no other way for a lawyer to reconstruct reality, and in fact, that's what they're doing. They're building it up from accounts, uh, from people's accounts, clients, witnesses, and so on. Uh, so there's no other way to present your uh, position but by representing it somehow, once again, like a novelist would tell a story. And mm -hmm. the kinds of stories lawyers tell change. Um, but of course, as we were saying before, uh, there is a difference. Lawyers, unlike, let's say, TV anchormen, uh, are subject to a code of ethics. I, I, I've not heard of an anchorman's code of ethics, but um, it, there, are, there are limits to what the lawyer um, can, uh, can do. Um, deceit, it, it would probably push uh, a bit too far, um, although what exactly is deceitful is, is a controversial yeah. question. Um, That's relative. It's relative, and of course, every time you are representing the interest of your client, you are pushing towards the edges of what can be um, persuasive to a, to a jury. How do lawyers know which stories to tell then? If they must yes. be essentially, to some regard, storytellers, what do they look to? Well, they look to the same sources as you and I and anyone else. Um, they mine the popular culture for whatever stories are floating around and available to them. And again, that's what lawyers have always done. Uh, I remember uh, a story by a uh, uh, very well-known trial attorney, Michael Tiger, who does a lot of trials around the country. And he said the first thing he does when he goes um, to another uh, state to try a case is he turns on the radio, he turns on the TV, he reads the local newspapers. And what is he doing? He's absorbing uh, what people are talking about and also how they're talking about it. After all, these are the uh, people that he's trying to reach. And if he's going to succeed, he's going to have to talk to them in a way that is familiar. Mm. So the stories and the images and the character types that lawyers tap into are the stories and images and character types that people have around, floating around in their minds when they come into the courtroom. Mm. Well, from, from my experience, I've also uh, graduated from law school and uh, a personal anecdote was uh, for me a first year law school we had a lawyering class and our first day of that class uh, the professor showed us two clips of films and uh, one was if I remember correctly now uh, To Kill a Mockingbird and the other one was uh, John Grisham film mm -hmm. and that sort of put me in the place to understand this there was my template this is what you should follow and that brought media directly to the student to the the novice attorney at the time. And mm -hmm. I just remember that vividly above and beyond the rest of the class, basically. Uh, many prosecutors are um, uh, uh, enamored of the mystery story genre. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a whodunit kind of story that allows them to say to a jury at the end of the case, here are all the facts that uh, we've put before you. Add up the pieces of the puzzle mm -hmm. and um, you will know who done it. In right. fact, let me give the you an example. Must work, yeah. It works. Let me give you an example. The O.J. Simpson case, Marsha Clark in summation after that long trial. What's the image she presents? It's the image of pieces clicking together. Mm -hmm. Why don't we take a look at that? Sure. She says adds up to Simpson's guilt. We've proven the opportunity to kill. We've given the time window in which he was able to kill because his whereabouts were unaccounted for during the time that we know the murders were occurring. We have the hand injuries that were suffered on the night of his wife's murder. To the left hand, as we know the killer was injured on his left hand. Here we hand. see the puzzle. His reaction to Detective Phillips when he made notification, when Detective Phillips said to him, Nicole has been killed, instead of asking about a car accident, the defendant asks, 
no question. We have the manner of killings, killings that indicate that it was a rage killing, that it was a fury killing, that it was not a professional hit. The manner of killing that indicates one person committed these murders, one person with the same style of killing. We have the Bruno Mali shoe print, size 12, his size shoe, all of them consistent, going down the Bundy walk. We have the Bundy, Bundy blood trail, his blood to the left of the bloody shoe prints. We have the blood in the Bronco, his and Ron Goldman's. We have the Rockingham blood trail. We have the Rockingham glove with all of the evidence on it. Ron Goldman fibers from his shirt, Ron Goldman's hair, Nicole's hair, the defendant's blood, Ron Goldman's blood, Nicole's blood. There he is. I see exactly how persuasive that is. Yes, there he is. The pieces mm -hmm. all add up, and who are we looking at? It's, of course, uh, the glowering face of O.J. Simpson. Now, of course, a trial lawyer doesn't have to tell a mystery. Uh, in fact, uh, if you're someone like Johnny Cochran, uh, you might prefer to tell a different kind of a story. He told a different kind of a story. Instead of looking back at the uh, historic facts, the clues in the uh, case that Marsha Clark fit so neatly together, he told a very different kind of a story. He told what we might call a hero quest story. The jurors were now on a journey. It's a journey toward justice. And the story that we're now seeing unfold in that courtroom is a, a, a journey in which jurors will be challenged by all kinds of um, uh, forces against them, but they ultimately, if they have the strength of character and the courage and the grace to see it through, they might do justice. They might send a message. They may oppose the forces of genocidal racism. Mm. Let me show you an example of what this kind of story looks like. Why, you were selected. There's something in your background and your character that helps you understand this is wrong. Maybe you're the right people at the right time, at the right place, to say no more. Stop this cover-up. Stop this cover-up. If you don't stop it, then who? Who then polices the police? You police the police. You police them by your verdict. You're the ones who send the message. They send the message. They can set justice right. And of course, this is justice in a large scale. This is not just one case. This is the entire corrupt police force, the corrupt forces of, uh, of official justice in the entire uh, jurisdiction. So that's a quite uh, different sort of story. Very challenging, uh, forward-looking, sending a message to the future. It's a powerful story. Hmm. Two sides of the coin. Yes. Now, do you see the lines of justice, politics, and journalism then disappearing in a slippery slope of the truth becoming a relative concept, like we see here? Well, you know, the, it's a, you say the truth. The truth has always been relative, uh, and, and in fact, um, uh, it depends on what kind of truth you're talking about. Um, there are many different kinds of truth that coexist. Let me give you an example of what Please I mean. Please do so. Uh, you could say um, truth exists as a matter of fact. Factual truth. Did it occur? Was the event the way we say it was? And so as an example, a man uh, approaches another man uh, and shoots him. What is the fact of that matter? Well, that we have a shooting. But then you ask um, another kind of a question, and you can shift perspective. If it's just a matter of was there a shooting, yes, as a factual matter, there was. But what if we add another dimension to it and ask, well, what exactly were the circumstances? What was the context? Uh, maybe it was a misunderstanding. Maybe the man who shot feared for his life mm. and was shooting in self-defense. Now we add a kind of level of symbolic truth on top of the factual truth, a layer of meaning that changes our interpretation of what occurred. Or we might say, well, maybe um, this account uh, um, should never have been allowed in the first place because it was the uh, product of a coerced confession. And the story is unlawful in the way it was obtained by, let's say, abusive police officers who had uh, uh, no right to obtain the information in the way that they did. That's a legal truth. 
that might uh, trump the other forms of truth. I see this is what you meant by uh, when you wrote, the kind of truth that we affirm may depend on the kind of story that is being told. That's right. Now, moving on to, uh, to the jury system itself. How severely do the storytelling techniques of attorneys undermine society's trust in it, in the jury system? Well, you know, I, I have to say throughout it all, I'm a great believer in the jury system. Uh, I think that uh, the common sense of the American people is a tremendous force, and it's a great virtue of democracy that we trust in that common sense. And I, I wonder if the challenge um, to the legal system uh, comes so much from the fact that lawyers um, uh, are good at their job in the courtroom, telling compelling stories. But rather, perhaps the challenge comes from the way mass media portrays their work in the courtroom. Uh, um, if we see uh, coverage of uh, trials, sensational trials, perhaps like the Simpson trial, uh, that um, uh, mislead uh, the public about the state of the law, if we come to believe, as a result of a single case, that um, uh, high-paid lawyers are uh, manipulating uh, facts um, or uh, preying upon uh, the jury's weaknesses, if the media become uh, preoccupied with that message, it's a good uh, chance that the public loses sight of the vast majority of cases uh, in the thousands of courtrooms across this great land in which juries are pursuing their uh, quest um, for truth and for doing the right thing in a particular case um, with great integrity. So what we're looking at now is basically a circular argument. It's that common everyday jurors watch TV, they watch films, they get an expectation from that, and in turn attorneys are feeding into that and this is what they provide the jury because there's the circular argument. That's what they're expected to do. Um, how then can the American legal system ever prevent its submersion into pop? Is it stoppable? No, it's not stoppable. Uh, it, it never was, and it never will be. Um, and I'm not so sure that that's a uh, scary thing. Uh, in my book, I try to distinguish uh, between two different things. One is the reality of legal storytelling as an everyday reality. That's all that we have uh, to rely upon, as we were saying earlier, when you want to reconstruct the uh, facts of a case. You need to put it together in a way that makes these dramas come to life. That's called a story. And lawyers will always be adapting their storytelling skills to changing story forms and even the changing media of storytelling. So that's why today, when visual communication has become a dominant form of storytelling, yes, you will see that in the courtroom. And that's unstoppable. I think we have to adapt to that, adapt to it in the courtroom, and adapt to it in the legal classroom where we teach lawyers uh, both to present images and to critique images, which is not really being done. Uh, but is that um, a threat? Does that mean that law goes pop? No. There's a second dimension to this that I emphasize in the book, and that is, well, when we see these images being portrayed, who is it that is putting the images out, and what is their motive? Now, in contrasting how cases were treated differently in the past with those of today, how have the fictions changed? They're still there. How have they changed? The fictions change with the culture. And uh, uh, different kinds of stories um, lose their effect uh, because of changing events, changing history, changing economics, changing technologies. Let me give you a specific example. Uh, if we went back, uh, let's say, a little more than a century ago uh, and thought about an uh, extremely sensational case, 1875, involving uh, an extremely well-known Brooklyn preacher by the name of Henry Ward Beecher. Mm -hmm. Now, Beecher was accused of committing adultery with his best friend's wife. Mm. This had I all know, the, no. uh, yes, that's right. I know, no. I know, no. And uh, particularly when you're nationally renowned and renowned for being a moral leader in the nation. All the greater the no-no. That's right. Yeah. Uh, and he had an interesting defense. Um, it, it might have come out of uh, 
the mouth of Groucho Marx, the defense went something like this, who are you going to believe, me or your own eyes? Mm. Because he played out a symbolic story in this trial that was nicely adapted to the culture at the time. He played out a sentimental romance story. He was a great hero to the people. And if they allowed themselves to believe that he could commit this kind of depraved act, who could you believe? Mm. Who in society would withstand that kind of scrutiny? If you are going to believe that this great man could commit this kind of deed, then no one is safe from a kind of internal corruption. Right, when exactly. that was a sentimental story that was dominant at the time, but emerging on the horizon of consciousness was another kind of story. Like Robert Stevenson, 20 years later, would write a novel uh, called uh, uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. The modern story was we hide within ourselves these terrible forces, all of us. Freud would write about this as well at the turn of the century. And um, the prosecution in the Beecher case said, that's right. We all have secrets. And you have to dig beneath the surface to get at um, the reality within. And the public, I think, was uh, frightened by the implications of that. They weren't ready for the modern novel, is another way of putting it. Mm -hmm. That was a few years off. So by preying upon a dominant literary kind of genre, a certain kind of story, this sentimental romance, uh, the Beecher uh, defense did, did quite well. They succeeded. Mm -hmm. And I doubt we could tell that kind of story today. Hmm. You mentioned in the first page of your book that uh, a particular film helped inspire you to write the book? Well, that's true. Can you tell me a bit more about that? Well, perfectly fitting, I guess, for this kind of book, which talks a lot about contingencies and chance. Uh, the origin of the book was completely fortuitous. I was showing a film um, in my criminal procedure class, a documentary, or so it was called, by a wonderful director called uh, Errol Morris, The Thin Blue Line. Mm -hmm. uh, it was about a uh, capital murder case, a police killing in Dallas. And I showed it to my students at the end of the semester as a kind of review. I told them to spot the procedural errors because based on that film, you would think that every single imaginable error that a prosecutor could commit was committed in that case. Mm -hmm. But a funny thing happened along the way. As I showed this film, I watched it a few times, I realized this was no documentary at all. It was shot through with all kinds of fictional devices, like Truman Capote's famous novel in True Blood, a real story mm -hmm. told with the tools of fiction. Well, it's the same thing with Morris's film, with one twist. This film had such impact that it reopened the case that it featured, and the man convicted was ultimately released from prison. But let me give you a, a sense of what kind of images were used in this film. Let's take a look. Stairs, what floor, I don't know, they, but they put me in a little room. Gus Rose walked in. He had a confession there he wanted me to sign. He uh, said that I would sign it. He didn't give a damn what I said. I would sign this piece of paper he's got. I told him I could. Okay, so Bianca, think about what we just saw. Okay, mm. this is the so-called documentary that freed a, an innocent man from prison, a man who, by the way, was on death row for over eight years. Uh, we saw several simulations, actors staging uh, the crime, mm. the interrogation, mingling with actual exhibits from the trial, photographs and charts, uh, plus, of course, the real defendant. Mm. It's this mingling of... Um, uh, reality and simulation Realities, that yeah. we've all gotten used to from watching Oliver Stone movies, except that what happens when that changes the course of a real criminal case? Mm -hmm. 
Now uh, we go from films, as we've covered, to art. Um, you compare pop art to pop, pop law. And I've noticed that you're, um, you have a common thread in your book, which is Warhol quotes. Yes, brilliant, which, uh, brilliant artist. Yes, one of my favorites. This is the, um, the reason for my question. Uh, a specific quote that captured my attention was, sex is more exciting on screen and between the pages than between the sheets. I conclude that Warhol was referring to the collapse of reality into image reality of what we just covered now, um, essentially the underpinning of your book. Uh, how then can we as jurors, lovers, consumers remain unjaded? Ah, that's a tough question. How can we remain unjaded? Well, maybe one suggestion is to keep our loving, judging, and consuming separate. Hmm. Uh, if they all jumble together, uh, perhaps that's um, a, a way of putting them at risk. Or, following up our Warhol's vision, if they all become as I was saying earlier, a kind of commodity that's consumable, an experience that we have and then use up once its stimulation value is over, um, I think that that undermines both our own authenticity as individuals, and I think it also leech leeches meaning out of the law itself. Our reality is over, at least for the time being Sorry this week. Yes, uh, we'd love to have you back. I would like thank to you. thank you. It's a pleasure. For uh, joining us. And I'd like to invite you all to come join us next time on Media Reporter. Hello, this is Bianca Bezdak here for Media Reporter. Are you tired of watching reruns of Law & Order and Court TV? Well, if you're interested in learning about real law, check us out on these channels once a week.